Good morning and welcome to Patriot Radio News Hour. I'm Joe Jaquin, CEO of the Patriot Trading Group, and our toll-free number, 800-951-0592. The website at allamericangold.com, and I am back in the Valley of the Sun uh, had a, a really great trip up to the front range and uh, just really good to see everybody again and and uh, get a lot of things done. So uh, it was a very, very productive trip and uh, ready to get back at it. Now listen, it's, it's, it's Memorial Weekend, so we are going to be closed on Monday. Uh, don't worry, the website 24-7. Uh, but if you want to uh, get anything done, get some orders placed, uh, talk to Arlene or whatever it may be, today is your day. Otherwise, you're going to have to wait till Tuesday. Uh, and that goes for uh, both Phoenix and Colorado. So uh, both uh, offices are closed. The radio stations are closed. Uh, and I hope all of you have a fantastic Memorial Weekend. Uh, I know that uh, I, I'm going to. That is for sure. It is my wife and I. It's our wedding anniversary, uh, 23 years. So we're looking forward to that. Our youngest, uh, he just got home, finished his freshman year of college. He actually drove home uh, yesterday. And, of course, you know, uh, Joey's already graduated working at Northwestern Mutual. I'm going to tell you right now. I've been telling you, and people are listening. If you want to protect what you have, I'm talking about the bubble run that you saw in your stock prices. If you want to protect that, give Joey a call, 602-909-9048. I'm joined, as always, with my partner up in Colorado, Jason Walker. And, and Jason, good morning, and we're going to do something a little interesting in, in the second half of this show. Yeah, I got something I found. And uh, Joe, Joe is the maestro of this show. I, I've been uh, on the show with him since September. And uh, I am the Ed McMahon. I, I like to, to put in a comment. I try I try to be the guy that uh, if you're, t you know, the, I, I listen to a lot. Everyone listens to a lot of radio. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to put the comments in uh, half the time that's like, hey, what are the guys on the radio saying? You know, talking to the radio. But uh, once in a while, I, I'll come to Joe with a little content, you know, try to try to help him carry the show. And I got something that normally I don't think Joe would ever put on the air, but I'll, I'll liken it to this. Uh, Brian and I, when we first came on the radio with Patriot Trading uh, News Hour, uh, early on, it, Joe had to took a vacation. We did the Titanic. Our first time we did the Titanic show, and people just went crazy. They're like, yeah, I, I've never even heard this stuff about the Titanic, about the bankers and right before they got their, their meeting. You know, at Jekyll Island. Well, this is kind of a hey, is is this something that the powers that be are going to do to actually mess with the financial fortunes of the world? Is is this an actual real thing? And it it's something that we did that really fits more with the half empty cup of Joe. But this is economics, and we know Joe that there are certain things that uh, the powers that be do. 9-11s and things like that, COVID, there's these things that uh, get blown out of proportion to, uh, you know, hide hide the little things they do, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I don't know uh, really anything about it. Jason just said, hey, I want to do this. And so uh, I'll be uh, listening uh, with everyone. We're going to do that in the second half. Uh, so what we're going to do is something a little different, but I think it'll be fun. And, you know, it's kind of a – uh, you know, a holiday weekend, so that's the plan. Yeah, yeah, the, it, it, this is uh, uh, Joe Brown. He has a YouTube channel, Heresy Financial. I, 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 he's one of the guys I'll play here and there. Uh, normally, I would just take a clip, and then Joe and I would talk about it, but there's he does a little bit of, uh, you know, hey, here's some types of economics that you need to understand. And he talks, uh, I think, Paul Krugman, This he's kind of an idiot that subscribes to Broken Window Economics, he, he, he's gonna By the way, Paul Krugman, absolute idiot. But anyway, go ahead. Oh, exactly. He, he, he's, he, let, let me tell you right <laughs> now, Paul Krugman, very well respected. Yes. Right, very well respected. You know, and he gets uh, op-eds all the time in the Wall Street Journal and all this and that. And 
Anyhow, I just wanted to. It's thirteen. Give you it's my a, opinion. It's a little more than thirteen minutes, so we need two full segments to get both uh, the whole thing. I, I normally you do a minute, you do three minutes, five minutes, but this is so well done. This guy is this guy is gonna be a rock star in the future with economics. He's really good at explaining things to people that don't understand this. Just like Joe and Eric have been doing for years. You, I, you got to listen to the whole thing. This is one of those that I had to bring to Joe. It's like, well, if we do this, we, you know, let's use the third and fourth segment, get the whole thing done. We're, we're excited. I'm excited. Jason's got to be excited. I'm kind of curious because uh, uh, I know that uh, when Jason brings stuff, it's usually a little bit more off the wall, but but uh, should be really, really good stuff. So we got that. So when we get back, uh, we'll go through economic day. We'll talk about what the markets are doing today and talk about uh, just kind of recap the week. And, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the second half of the show. 800-951-0592, Patriot Radio News Hour. We'll be back after we pay a few bills. 800-951-0592, Patriot Radio News Hour. And uh, we're watching the market. Uh, the Dow's had a good week this week after eight straight weeks of decline. Uh, you know, think about uh, haven't seen that since 1932. There's a reason. Because this is exactly where we're headed. Of course, it's going to be worse. As Jason likes to call it, we're going to the double Great Depression. Because not only are we going to have a depression, it's going to be a depression with inflation. But this little relief rally on no economic data, because all the economic data that's been out has not been good. You know, yesterday, I mean, I, and I hated, uh, and I did, I hated it about what's happening in the housing market. You know, when, when you see unprecedented slowdowns, you have to pay attention to it. But this week's rally is based on, hey, we, we think the Federal Reserve's a bunch of cowards, which they are, but this is, this is bigger than even the cowardly lion. This whole rally this week is based on the fact that they think the, the, the Fed, Jason, is only going to be able to hike rates two more times. 50 basis points in the next meeting, which is coming up here in June. And then there's a debate of the, the following rate hike. May, it may be 50, it may be 25, but then the Fed's going to stop on, on this illusion. And, and again, I don't understand what these guys are looking at. I mean, we're seeing, uh, you know, April, we got this, you know, I'll call it the inflation reprieve. And really, the only reason we got a reprieve in inflation in April was 500 million people in China were locked down. That, that was why. And, of course, I told you that. These guys know that. Well, I think they know that. Maybe they don't know that. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is they have to raise rates because inflation is going to be this so hot. They're going to have to raise rates till they break it, period. That's it. That's the, really the only choice. And, and here's the sad part and why I say it's the only choice. You can't stop with a Fed's funds rate of 175. Because if they raise 50 basis points in the next two meetings, that's what it would be, 175. That's historically, if you just throw out the garbage years, and, and let's call it really what it was. You know what it was? The super bubble years. That are going to lead us into, as Jason calls it, the double Great Depression. What was the old commercial? Double the flavor, double the fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Right. right. I mean, that's that's really where we're headed, Joe. It's, it, it has the it, potential it, to be a calamity really... that we never. It has the potential to be a calamity, Joe, that will rival, like I've said before, the, the Lord, you know, the, the age of lords and peasants, the Dark Ages, Joe. And, and just understand, really, if you put it in perspective. Dow 6700, that was the low after the financial crisis. Think about what they did and all the money they created. The Dow got to almost 37,000. That was incredible. And, and think about how we did it. By and large, 
outside of a, a few moments under under Trump, GDP really, I mean, best case, let's call it 2%, right? Best case, 2%, right? We had uh, the war in Afghanistan, right, where we spent trillions. We, we've had uh, a deficit that was under $10 trillion. That is now $31 trillion. A balance sheet that wasn't a Fed balance sheet that was under a trillion, now it's nine. Well, you know, eight, eight or whatever, I don't, however many they're selling right now. But real, no, not, not any great economic, we had a, the, the job machine, which was comprised of waiters and waitresses and bartenders, right? The, the, the great job engine. With, and, and well, I guess, let's not forget, with, with people with college degrees doing those jobs, uh, we had student loan debt. Let's be fair. Student loan debt has tripled. Then we have student loan debt now two trillion, and all of the other endless pumping that they did. All of this has to deflate now. All of this has to come crashing back down. But I, I don't blame Wall Street. I, I get it, you know, because this is all they've known. Well, no, no, no. The Fed just comes to the rescue. Right, they rescued us during the dot com. They rescued us after nine eleven. They rescued us at the fi uh, at the housing crisis and the financial crisis. Right, they're gonna they reckon, uh, they they rescued us. Well, I'll call it the the uh, liquidity tr uh, bond trap that was uh, under Trump. Now Trump had nothing to do with it, but the Federal Reserve. Remember, at the end of twenty eighteen, right, the stock market went back down to twenty grand. For, and then they rescued it again. There is no rescue. There is no rescue. But let me tell you the links that they go to. So the big economic data out today. Uh, we had a bunch of earnings. They were all bad. Citigroup has come out and says, let me just say uh, really simply, they downgraded the stock market and is telling everybody to get defensive because of a deflating bubble. Let me give you Joey's number again, 602-909-9048. I'm telling you, if you're not buying gold, that's the next number you call. Well, first, you call me, buy gold, then you call my son. That's interesting, Joe. They say that they'd be careful with the, about the markets, and, uh, well, they're up this week. Isn't that great? They're the, they, yeah. Yeah. Wow, the warnings are out. Well, but, you know what? They put all that 401k money to work. Uh, man, it, it, it's got to be frustrating. It's got to be very, very frustrating. But neither here nor there. I don't want to get sidetracked here because we only got a few more minutes and we're going to shift gears. Here's the link that the media and the central bank go to. And, and really quickly, by the way, I don't know if any of you saw the Washington Post. The propaganda war with Russia, Ukraine, you know, everything. Oh, how demoralized the Russian troops are. We're killing all their generals and this and that. Uh, apparently, the Washington Post said, um, well, we may have a problem here. Uh, Ukrainian forces are fleeing the battlefield in mass and defecting in mass. And, and, you know, but again, propaganda. The Fed today came out with their favorite inflation gauge. And it's the lead headline on CNBC. And think about this. They decided, you know what? We've got six different inflation numbers, just like they got six different employment numbers. We don't like any, the, the, and, and, and they've changed all the formulas to make it appear, way, you know, as an example, CPI, 8.3%. Now that was down, that was April, 8.3, down for March is 85 all of us in the real world are like, what are they talking about? Inflation's at least double that, and and and, and most likely probably twenty percent. But that's still not good enough, Jason. Nope. Now they got to say, you know what? We've got another number. 
They call it the PCE deflator. So I'll give them credit. You know what? And I love it when, they, when they're really trying to pull the wool over our eyes. They actually just put right in the title the, 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 the ridiculousness. They even put deflator. Hey, we're, we're deliberately going to understate the number, and we're going to put it right in the title of it. And that way, you, you'll actually buy into it, right? It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. But listen to this. The Fed's favorite inflation measure, now why is it the favorite? Because it's always the lowest, was only 4.9% in April, Jason. Mm. Well, mm. I, don't, I don't have a feeling when mm. we actually get into a depression that this, this little mm. deflator, uh, well, they'll stop talking about it in the middle of a depression. They just need it right now, right? Yes, and here's the good news. Ready for this? That was down from March. Uh. Because in March, it was like 5.2%. And, and I won't even, and again, the, the whole point of it all is that this is the ridiculous things that the bankers try to do to say, see, it's okay, don't worry. right? We, I know we took away your pensions. right? And I know that we're supposed to have a stable dollar uh, but but don't and I know that we created this inflation target that said two percent and of course it's just ridiculous. But it's not good enough. We had to come up with another mathematical formula. I mean, think about the genius of this. First, we already took the real number and manipulated it so it it, it would be at best lower the real number by at least half. But that's still not good enough. Nope. Now we got to go in there and, you know, massage it even more so we can get it even lower. And even at 4.9 and the month before, 5.2, those are 40 year highs on those numbers, Jason. That's right. That's right, Joe. I mean, it was, I think it was just yesterday we talked about, uh, I was just pointing out that right there in Longmont, I had to rent for a little while, you know, and, uh, I was renting at 1950 a month. Now the same size house, same area. 2900 plus per month. 18 I know it's 18 months but still Joe that's 50% in 18 months that's that's easily 25%, 30% or more. That's just, and, well, and you got to remember that's on your biggest your biggest bill. Yep. So it, it it's actually worse. Yep. Uh when you look at incomes when your biggest bills uh jump by that kind of of amount. There's no amount of pay raise uh, that 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 could fix any of these things, and this is why I said they're going to race. Because you know what's going to break it? I don't even know that they can get to three percent before it breaks. But I know this: one, they're not stopping at one and a half or one seven five, because, like I told you, listen, gas is going to be six bucks before the summer's over. Sorry, it just is. Joe, the question Food prices. The I mean. The question might be, how long does it have to be completely broken before they turn around? Maybe that's the question. It, it'll break real hard, but how long in the zone of really broken will they leave it before they reverse? That, that might be the question, right? Yeah, and, and again, I think the harder question is, and I'm of this nature, and, and maybe I'm alone on this. I don't think they can reverse. Because that's how hot inflation is going to be. They'll stop raising. I don't know. You might be right, Joe, because what I'm about to play. I don't know. Let me tell you. Gold's at new all-time highs when they stop raising. If they actually go into reverse, gold's going to the stratosphere because uh, inflation will just be roaring. Lael Bernard uh, Brannard, we got to keep an eye on her. You know, she just got the promotion. She's next, right? She's She's going to be the next head of the Fed after Jerome Powell. She was talking digital currency today, and just take my word for it, she didn't use words like, well, you know, we're, we're studying it, or we're looking into it, or uh-uh. She basically said, hey, this is what we're doing. A central bank digital currency, now, she says, hey, it can exist alongside stable coins. 
And those stable coins are going to be your Bitcoin Ethereum. Uh, she said that as a compliment, and she likened it ready for this, and, and this is the, 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 the most important part of it. She said, just like today's system, where, where uh, cash and, and finance kind of go together, this will be what the digital currency will be. So get ready. 800-951-0592. Before we get to the next segment, I just want to read it to you because it's really important. By the way, uh, $20 gold today, twenty one seventy five. Uh, gold's up again today, uh, almost back to where it was before the profit taking took place earlier this week. Right now, gold's 1854. It's up seven. Uh, silver above 22 here, uh, up about 20 cents here, 22.15. But here was Lael Brandard talking about the digital currency, saying it can coexist with and be complementary to stable coins and commercial bank money by providing a safe central bank liability in the digital financial ecosystem see this is this just tells you your money's not safe because when they bring this in because it's going to be a crisis this is what they're going to use hey this is safe sorry that other stuff wasn't safe but this is going to be safe oh boy. and then she gave an example much like cash currently coexist with commercial bank money so another little chestnut little little, little uh, clue she gave you which one of those do you think is going away cash or commercial bank money. Well, it's actually pretty easy because she already said in her, her first statement that the digital currency can coexist with commercial bank money. So commercial bank money is not the one that's going away, Jason. Cash is what's going away. But don't worry, it'll be safe. Along with that will be privacies and, and freedoms going away with it. Absolutely. Do not get it. Your cash is not safe. And now she's not talking about the cash under your mattress, even though that's that's what a lot of you are thinking, the cash in my wallet. No, 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 no. No. She's talking about the cash in your bank account. She's talking about the cash that's in your retirement accounts. That's what's not safe. That's what she's talking about. That's why you need to have gold, 800 951 Zero five nine two. Jason, uh, uh, now now we're ready. Let, let's right. let's shift gears. This is going to be a hard shift. Yeah, just 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 enjoy, you know, listeners in Arizona. Uh, this is you know this is a little offbeat, but I think you guys like the offbeat if it's presented right. Joe, you almost segued perfectly into this on the last segment when you said, you know, maybe I'm the only one, but they they may not reverse course. They may just continue raising rates. You know, where, where are they really going to go? And well, they they could keep raising rates to ten percent, Joe. Go to five percent. Go to six percent. Go to eight percent. But they would have to have some sort of a disaster, some sort of a narrative as to why this is the only place the economy has to go. So something that makes the economy completely exploding be number three or four on the news. And there, and we're going to play this. This is uh, J uh, Joe Brown. He, he does a YouTube channel thing, Heresy Financial. I don't put a lot of this stuff on this show because this guy and Joe are kind of similar in, in, in the way they report the news. We don't need him because Joe does it just fine. But once in a while, he uh, he goes a little bit into the in-between in zone of Jason and Joe, and this is where I like to play some of his stuff. So this is called, Is the Government Faking UFOs to Rescue the Economy? It sounds completely conspiratorial. What gives it its, its uh, credence is the government is actually doing this. So let's let's listen to Joe Brown. You're going to love this, and we'll we'll have comments uh, at, the, at the end of this hour into the next hour. Is climate change and aliens have in common? Yes, I know that sounds like the start of a corny dad joke. I promise it's not. What do they have in common? It's the fact that the United States wants to start a war against them in order to stimulate 
the economy. Just as economists look back and say World War II pulled us out of the Great Depression, and just like economists today say that the fight against climate change can help stimulate the economy, now it looks like the U.S. government is prepping the U.S. citizenry for a war against aliens as this timing on the ufo information is just a little bit too perfect i hope i am not right about this because just as the government was wrong about the economic effects of world war ii and just as they were wrong about the economic effects about fighting climate change they will be devastatingly wrong about the economic implications of fighting fake aliens ready let's dive in Right now, Congress is being briefed on unidentified aerial phenomena, UAPs, because they don't want to use the word UFOs, for the first time in decades. But to be honest, the timing of this is a little bit suspicious. Why now? What motive could they possibly have for bringing this in front of the American people in the way they're doing it, with military intelligence saying we have no idea what these things are, no less? In order to answer that question, the first thing we have to do is take a little trip back in time to World War II. In 1940, U.S. unemployment was 14.6%. But just a few years later, towards the end of World War II, unemployment was down to 1.2%. GNP had doubled, there was huge progress with technology and innovation, and so World War II is looked at by many mainstream economists as being the reason that America was able to pull out of the Great Depression. The only problem is, it's not true. This is a classic example of the broken window fallacy. The broken window fallacy starts by looking at some form of economic spending, and it usually disregards the purpose or the need for that spending, only looks at the first order consequences of that spending, and if the result of that is good, then they say, hey, the whole entire ordeal was good. So they look at World War II and they say, hey, we had a lot of spending. We had a lot of people get to work. We had a lot of people build machines. We added to the workforce. We had all this growth of economic activity. Therefore, it was good economically speaking. But as Per Byland points out in his book, The Seen, The Unseen, and The Unrealized, you can't just stop with the very first thing that happens. You have to look at everything, including the things that don't happen, which is very hard to do. So Bastiat is the one who came up with the broken window fallacy in its form about the broken window. It's about a boy who throws a rock or hits a baseball, breaks a window, and then his father has to go and pay to replace the window. The townspeople look around and they say, hey, well, that caused some spending to happen, and now that window maker has more money than he would have otherwise, and he can go spend it on other things, and so it's actually a good thing that the kid broke the window because that stimulates some, some spending, and uh, people are better off as a result. But what is ignored here in this example is that the father now is left with less disposable income than he would have had before. Let's say he was gonna go out and spend that money on a pair of shoes. Now the shoemaker doesn't have the money that he would have had otherwise. But even more important is the fact that the replacement of the window resulted in the same amount of real wealth. Because money isn't wealth, money measures wealth, and money is a claim on wealth. But real wealth is... We're gonna hit the break, Joe. We got, uh, we'll, we'll uh, continue playing this on the next segment as he gets, as he, as he takes this economic idea and he's going to bring in uh, a whole lot more. We'll be right back, everybody. Stay tuned. Hey, we're back here, Patriot Radio News Hour. This is a kind of a special half hour, uh, and we'll get right back into it. The broken window theory of Francis Bastiat. Uh, those of you KHNC listeners, uh, Chris Lewis talks about him all the time, Jason. That's absolutely right. So let's let's get in. Let's get him to finish this up, and then he'll take us into where this where the government actually comes into this with uh, with this this so called fix they might try goods and services. And so the total pool of wealth when a window was destroyed and then was rebuilt did not increase. Whereas if the father would have just gone out and waste, wasted his money and spent it on a new window without that one being uh, first broken, at least the society would have been better off by having an extra window that it could have been could have used for a purpose that a window would have need, needed to be used for. And so if we push this example to its extreme, it would be like the boy swinging 
a bat hitting a baseball into a building and the whole building just explodes and falls down. And now the entire community has to rebuild that building. Well, you very clearly see now you're diverting many real resources, stone, wood, drywall, electrical supplies, like everything in order to rebuild that building. That city, that town, that society would be much worse off because you have to spend all those resources, all that saved up labor, all of your money, the capital will be diverted into just giving yourself back what you already had. And so you have a loss of real wealth, not a gain, not staying the same. And this is the exact same thing that happens in time of war. Yes, there's spending. Yes, there's an increase in economic activity, but you're taking real resources, steel, oil, supplies, food, people and you're sending them off to be destroyed to be wasted to destroy other real resources like buildings and uh, also the giant the biggest one is the loss of life of the soldiers who go and fight all of this together results in a net drastic decrease in total wealth not a net gain yes you can have some winners and some losers meaning empire goes out you can have some big losers and then in the case of America, some big winners because you take advantage of your empire, sure, but on net, you lose. Now, despite the obvious flaws in this line of thinking, once you've actually taken a moment to think through it critically, it caught on and it became virtually mainstream. Every economist out there accepts things like this as truth, even though they're garbage. So much so that economists who are Nobel Prize winners, like Paul Krugman, flaunt this fallacy when talking about aliens, but more on that later. Don't want to get too ahead of myself. Now, if we fast forward from World War II to just a few decades ago, central bankers around the world started to get very concerned about the environment, the green movement climate change, global warming. We have central banks like the Bank of Japan unveiling a plan to boost funding for fighting climate change. Essentially, world leaders bought into this fallacy that we need a giant enemy for the world to fight against in order to stimulate the economy and cause growth. The only problem with a real war is that you have the death and the destruction. And so they came up with this brilliant plan saying, hey, if we can plant the seeds and get everybody on earth unified and fighting against this large enemy that's outside of humanity, climate change, we can stimulate a lot of growth, stimulate the, the global economy, and we'll, we'll launch ourselves into a utopian future. The only problem with this is that, just as you might expect, there were some unexpected consequences. Because it turns out, when you make a war on something like climate change, and you say the cause of that is energy, you're really making a war on energy. When you make a war on energy, turns out you get less of it. And when you get less energy, you get an energy shortage. And when it turns out, when you get an energy shortage, people no longer care about the environmental impact. They just want to get the energy however they can. So you have countries like Germany who've been decommissioning clean energy from nuclear for years and are now subject to getting dirtier energy from oil and gas from Russia. So we're getting the war, the actual war, and we're getting all the dirty energy that we thought we were fighting against. It's just a win-win scenario. So now all these world leaders are looking around and they're realizing, ah, eh, didn't really go according to plan. Climate change isn't exactly an issue that's uniting the entire world to rally against a single cause outside of ourselves, making the world a better place. But instead of recognizing the stupidity of trying to pull the strings of humanity, they're now turning around and saying, well, the problem wasn't what we were doing. The problem was we picked the wrong enemy. Now enter aliens. Because for the first time since the 60s, Congress is getting briefed on UFO by military intelligence. And now the public is being made aware for the first time ever of military sight, confirmed military sightings, hundreds of them of objects that defy the laws of physics, that move faster than any aircraft or object that humans have the capability to create, that stop on a dime creating G-forces far larger than any human body could uh, absorb, 
and stay alive, and then disappearing and reappearing in a flash, literally objects defying the laws of physics, where their instruments have confirmed these are physical objects and confirmed the speed. Hundreds of these. But why now? One more trip back in time to 2011. We're going to look at that brilliant Nobel Prize winning economist, Paul Krugman. Because in 2011, he started saying something that today sounds like an ominous prediction about the future and the future power grab by governments and not just the ignorant, stupid economic prescription that he was making. Watch this. Think about World War II, right? That was not that was actually negative social product spending and yet it brought us out. I mean, if if we if we discovered that uh, you know space aliens were planning to attack, and we needed a, a massive buildup to counter the, the space alien threat, um, and really inflation and budget deficits took secondary uh, place to that. Um, this slump would be over in 18 months, and then if we discovered, whoops, we made a mistake. There aren't actually any. Space so we aliens. need Orson Welles. Would be a better. What you're saying? No, that's right. That's yeah, yeah, Paul Krug. We're going to finish this on the last segment of this show, and Joe will have a comment when we get back. Hey, final segment here at Patriot Radio News Hour. Remember, twenty dollar gold, twenty one seventy five, and, and it sounds like to me, Jason. Like I said, I haven't heard the clip, but it sounds like what what we're hearing here is after the collapse here, this double Great Depression. The answer is going to be spending on aliens. That's, yeah, that's the theory behind this. I mean, uh, this isn't the Alex Jones show, but for uh, about two years now, he's been talking about the fake alien invasion. So when I see a clip like this from a guy that doesn't do conspiracy, you know, now Joe Brown does conspiracy from central bankers and government, but he doesn't go into uh, lizards running the government and, and uh, stuff like that. So when he brings in something like this, it's, you know, it's you know, H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds. How long? Every 80 years we go through an economic cycle, Joe. Were they planning the next re reset of the economy Way back after World War II, knowing that, hey, in 80 years, we got to have the next one. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to be aliens, Joe. It can be any huge catastrophic event that everybody has to be. But here's the thing. The, the one thing that makes this plausible is that the entire world would have to band together to, 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 to fix the big enemy. Right, Joe? That's that's what makes it. Let, let me play a few more minutes of this so we can get through it uh, to, to end the show. But, uh, yeah, Paul Krug, he's going to talk about, oh, hey, there was an episode of The Twilight Zone. Listen to this. There's a, there was a Twilight Zone episode like this in which uh, scientists fake a, uh, an alien threat in order to achieve world peace. Well, this time we don't need it. We need it in order to get some fiscal stimulus. Oh, well, my mistake. If the Twilight Zone had an episode about it, it must be true. But in all seriousness, this is why at the beginning of the video I said, I hope what I'm about to talk about does not come true. Because what it looks like is happening right now is, number one, the same mistake that... Uh, central planners and interventionistas have always made when looking at the economy. They've always looked and they've said, hey, as long as we can pull the right strings, we can get the outcomes that we want. Instead of just saying, anytime we try and pull strings, it causes major problems, so we should just stop pulling strings and let people do whatever they want, and it turns out that when you give people freedom, they create the most wealth that's ever been created in history. No, we're going to completely ignore that. We're going to keep on saying, well, we just haven't pulled the right strings yet. So on the backs of World War II and saying, forget all the destruction we caused, Look, we caused a lot more employees and a lot bigger tax base. Woohoo, that's a win for us. And instead of saying, hey, we failed with trying to get people to rally against this global cause for the climate ch for climate change and this green movement, and in fact it actually caused massive devastation and is now causing wars and is now causing many countries to be subject to dictators and evil regimes, no, instead we need a bigger enemy. A bigger enemy that is outside of humanity, an enemy that is aliens. There you go. That's, that's essentially it, Joe. How about that, huh? Well, you know, it is interesting uh, as to uh, all of a sudden, you know, the the alien thing kind of uh, it, again. We're all distracted, right? We're, we're it's inflation and gas and diesel prices, food shortages, Russia, Ukraine, and and at the same time, uh, we're debriefing Congress uh, about UFOs and and again not because they're all of a sudden there's been this huge increase in UFO sightings but it's just hey over the years here's all the you know the oh. last 50 years of stuff uh, 
It sounds ridiculous, Joe, until until what does it? until right. co until COVID nineteen had us all wearing masks and taking vaccinations out of nowhere, right? Amen to that.